Just waiting a few. Conf Only 331. So we okay. got to, now Stay. it's 32, so we can get started. <laughs> uh, okay, we're on YouTube Live. I did it, Tommy. Way to go. You're a good coach. Um, just want to welcome anyone. First of all, if you're new to this plumb line Zoom call, thank you for taking the time to join us. This is actually our regular weekly call. Uh, every Thursday, we do it from 2.30 to 4. We've been doing this since March of 2020. And uh, that, and what spurred that call was a burden over the prophetic that was happening here in the States. And we just continue to meet weekly. We've known each other for decades. Uh, I just, I did a quick count. I think the five of us total about 200 years of experience in ministry. So hopefully we have something to say that can help. Uh, as the weeks unfolded, the Lord gave us pretty clear Amos 7, verse 8. And, uh, you know, what do you see, Amos? I see a plumb line. And, of course, that's a measuring device. And pretty much that's our mandate is to present a plumb line to the body of Christ. Uh, we did one on the prophetic in September of 2020. Then we had a couple of conferences with Steve in Knoxville. Uh, we did one in Greensboro. I see John's on, and uh, maybe last year that was. And then we do an annual uh, national um, gathering every September in Minneapolis. And we will also be doing it this year as well. If I forget, uh, September 26, 7, and 8 are the dates for our September, September meeting. As the weeks continue to unfold, once in a while we've had a guest come on this call. And today we have a wonderful guest from Wales, uh, Julian Richards. And uh, I'm going to have Clem uh, give a bit more of a formal introduction. He knows Julian far better than I do. He's been going to Wales for over 30 years, I believe, ministering there with Julian. Um, just a couple. Everybody has their cell phones on silent. Uh, I believe uh, we're going to put everyone on mute during Julian's message. Uh, later on, when obviously you're going to want to comment or ask question, you'll have to unmute yourself. I won't be able to do it on my end. Um, Julian's going to go about 40 minutes. Man, if the anointing's on him, if he wants to go longer, we're, we're pretty flexible here on this. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of a starting point, brother. Uh, and by the way, if, if I may say right now, Julian, we really receive you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we receive the anointing, the calling, the gifting that's in you. And uh, we're, we're believing for a impartation to our hearts, which is the essence of true apostolic. It's all about impartation rather than uh, even information. I was seeking the Lord, obviously, before this call, and I, I said, Lord, is there a scripture? Uh, and he gave me Jeremiah 12, verse 5. If you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? And... Obviously, we're going into some serious, challenging times. I guess we're already there. And one of our summits a couple of years ago it was all about persecution coming to the church in America. So part of our burden is to see believers equipped, anchored in truth, filled with the Spirit, walking in their calling, and being ready to be faithful, whatever. Uh, may come. So I just share that scripture and you can ponder it more uh, later. Obviously, the Lord's cleansing his house here in America, and we want to respond to that and be open to that. Um, 
Okay, Clem, get ready. I'm going to mute everyone here. And Clem, I want you to uh, please introduce Julian and and then uh, Brother Julian will be able to share. Excellent. Clem, you'll have to unmute yourself. There we go. Hi, everybody. Glad you could join us. Um, yeah, I met Julian and Sarah Richards uh, in 1988, so you can do the math. It was a while ago, and really started building more intentionally with them in the 90s as they planted um, Cornerstone Church in Swansea, Wales. And throughout the years, we've just, you know, just bonded in fellowship, relationship, brotherhood, and also understanding together the fivefold ministry, particularly the role of apostles and prophets in building the church. Julie's going to share an ama his amazing testimony of how God led them to plant and begin to really affect a nation. And uh, not embellishing that at all, he really has. I've, I've been a, an observer of his ministry, Cornerstone Church, and then they birthed New Wine Wales in about 2000, uh, 2010, which is a, he'll explain that movement and how this become a movement of unity, a movement of uh, equipping uh, churches, particularly in the prophetic and healing. And I know he'll share a lot of testimonies. And uh, so we've uh, been able to walk together all these years. And, and because we meet our plumb line guys, we tend to be kind of focused on North America. We're all living in North America, including riches in Canada. But we also have international scope. And so in my many years working with Julian, I think it's going to be a breath of fresh air if we hear what is God doing in other nations. We need a nation's prophetic perspective, not just an American. And so I, I just trust and pray that he's going to impart, as Chuck said, uh, something that's happening in his nation. It's really going to affect the UK. And I think, uh, I think even globally, there's a movement of God going on in the earth. And he's going to give a snapshot of what uh, he sees, uh, not only prophetically, but from an apostolic view. And then we're going to also highlight uh, an amazing book he just recently released called Apostolic Priorities. So he'll share some of those things, and I just want to echo Julian. Take take your time. Uh, talk you know talk to us about what's happening in Wales. A little bit of history. Talk to us about um, the apostolic and prophetic you know initiatives that have been taking place, and how you really are building something very unique in the nation of Wales. So over to you, Julian, and welcome. Thanks, Clem. Uh, it's great to see you again, and thank you, Chuck, and all of you plumbline guys. <laughs> who have uh, allowed me and trust me to come onto your platform for, uh, well, I got 40 minutes and nine and then questions, but uh, I really do consider it an honor and a privilege. And I appreciate your trust because um, you don't know me. I mean, Tommy knows me and Clem's known me before we know each other about 30 years, but I won't speak anymore because I'm going to, I'm already eaten into my time and I don't want to uh, take too much of your time on Zoom because I know how, depleting zoom can be just watching uh well you all know about wales don't you it's wales is famous for its revivals uh the most famous one is the 1904 i think but actually it's had uh, so many revivals uh my favorite is the um 1859 revival if you ever get a chance to read about it it's a great book by philip thomas who was an eyewitness, and it was a prayer revival. There were no great names, no great faces, no great preachers, but it started as uh, right across the nation. Uh, people would pray, they would pray in unity, they'd pray in the chapels, they'd pray in the churches, they'd pray in the streets, they'd pray in the... And the presence of God would just come. <laughs> and and uh, non-people who didn't know Jesus, they were overcome with the presence of God, and they would be in turmoil until they gave their lives to Christ. And it swept right across the, uh, the nation and right across all the denominations. And at the same time, there was the same revival in Ireland and Glasgow and um, Sweden. And it was just an amazing revival. Check it out. But we've seen so many revivals in our nation. My home, where I actually live, I live about four miles from where the Welsh revival of 1904 happened. And on October the 31st, 1904, Evan Roberts was speaking to a group of young people in the Sunday school room next to uh, the now Mariah Chapel. And uh, they prayed and the presence of God came in such power. 
And within three months, 100,000 people had come to Christ and the whole nation was engulfed in the reviving presence of God. There were reports of miners who were in, because uh, Wales is a mining nation or was then, coal miners in the pits and the spirit of the God began to move. And as they walked out of the mines, all you could see was white lines where they'd been, these hardened men had been weeping in the presence of God uh, as, as, the, as God moved and touched their hearts. In fact, I'm in my church office now. And right below me, this was our first building that we bought. It was a former GPO sorting office, but it was built on a mine. And below where I am now in this is, is an actual chapel where the mine workers asked the managers if they could have a place right underneath the ground in the dark, in the dark caverns of the coal mine that they may pray. And, and they would pray on a daily basis for some 80 to 90 years. And it only stopped when all the coal resources began to become too expensive to mine and the collieries began to close. So we have a tremendous history. And of course, you will know from from the Welsh revival, then there was Rhys Howells and six miles drive away from us sitting now is the Bible College of Wales where Rhys Howells and his intercessors used to pray through the Second World War and their pray prayers altered the course of history as God would reveal to them the battles that were taking place that they didn't even know about because the uh, British intelligence and military, military would know about it, but they didn't know and they would pray and God would direct them how to pray and the course of the battle would change and then they would of course discover what had happened in the press some weeks later. Uh, all documented stuff, absolutely amazing. The Welsh Revival, it went all over the nation. Industrial disputes between the workers and managers that had been going on for years and years just stopped uh, virtually overnight. The judges would actually travel from village to village or town to town across the nation to try the prisoners. But as they got there, they were handed these white gloves uh, and it was a symbol of there's nobody in prison to try. The crime rate dropped virtually down to zero. Uh, it affected domestic abuse situations. Um, it was an absolutely astonishing revival. But the, the interesting thing about it, it only lasted about nine months. And this is the thing about revivals, and Wales is steeped in it, and we're very, very aware of the of the length that revivals can start. They have an incredible impact at the time, but many revivals are short-lived. However, they often become a spark for movements uh, where people who've been touched by the revival or inspired by the revival have organized themselves into movements of God's people. And movements of God's people generally have a greater longevity and because of their longevity, many of them have a greater societal and spiritual transformational impact over the course of the years than the revival, although very powerful at the time, ever did. And we've seen this, for example, I mean, you will know of it, of the Wesleyan revival, the Wesleyan move, where it wasn't just a, a move of God, but there was this movement of mission and church and establishing of church that had a phenomenal societal impact over the course of years, over the course of the years. And in Wales, we've seen the same thing. We've had the Pentecostal movement, the Jeffrey brothers with the Elam Pentecostal movement and the Assemblies of God Pentecostal movement in the UK and around the world. All these people were saved in the Welsh revival, but they started their movements Many years, the Welsh Revival came to and started to wane nine months after it started in 1904. In 1916, the Jeffrey Brothers started the Pentecostal movement in Wales and the UK. And the interesting thing is, is that it is the, it's the movements from the inspiration of these revivals or, or uh, those who have a deep call of God upon their lives to... Uh, initiate these movements can have a tremendous prevailing effect over the course of time in any given generation. And uh, uh, Clem mentioned my book, Apostolic Priorities, and one of the things I track in, in the book is 
what were the distinguishing features of movements that had a prevailing transformational effect over courses of time, decades and sometimes generations? And what was the distinguishing features of those revive of those movements that began to wane and become institutionalized? And whilst they still existed in terms of shape as church or a denomination or a network, had lost their juice, had lost their prevailing power, their conversion rate, their societal transformation presence. What 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 are the distinguishing features? And the distinguishing features, in a nutshell, are this. Is the movements, the church movements, that adhere most closely to the apostolic priorities that we first see in Jesus, that he imparted into his apostles, the Twelve, that they embedded into the New Testament church. The movements that adhere to those apostolic priorities that we see in Christ, the first apostle, the 12 that they embedded into the apostolic church, the New Testament church. Those are the, those are the movements that have the greatest longev longevity and prevailing power. And the movements that actually begin to digress and move away from those apostolic priorities are the ones that, whilst they most still maybe st uh, gather people or be around in name, they they lose their conversion effect and the societal transformational effect. So I was speaking to uh, what I won't name the, the movement, but I was speaking to one of the um, <clears throat> uh, leaders of a denomination that came out of the revival. There's been a number of Pentecostal or spirit-filled denominations that came out of the revival, and one of those leaders was converted in the revival. Um, and now, you know, a couple of hundred years later, I, I was speaking to the present day leader. And uh, in its day, this particular denomination was the most influential and most powerful of all the Pentecostal movements in the UK. I mean, what that denomination did was absolutely astonishing. But today they're the smallest, they have the least conversion rate, and they have the least impact. And he was explaining to me after uh, us examining these apostolic priorities, he realized that that's where his denomination dropped the ball. They, uh, they moved away from the apostolic priorities that you see in Christ, the Apostles, New Testament Church, and they went into management and they went into institutionalism and they went into just doing a form of church that seemed on the outside seemed respectable, but on the inside lost its prevailing power. And uh, as a result, he went back to his leadership team and they're now beginning to transform the whole of the denomination, both in the UK and around the globe, to try and get back to the early roots again. And so what are those uh, priorities? Well, we see them first in Jesus, our first apostle. Um, the very nature of Jesus was that he was a missional man, fully divine, clothed in humanity, but sent from the Father with a mission. And the nature and the first fundamental priority of Jesus and his apostles was mission. The mission of the gospel, they were sent with a mission to bring the kingdom of God that is seen in heaven to earth. Even when he spoke to his first disciples and they said, teach us how to pray. He says, well, pray like this. This is how you pray. Your father, which is in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's a missional prayer. The advancing of the kingdom of God through the prayers and the lives and the activities of God people. It's very interesting that Jesus took 12 disciples and then he took that 12 disciples and he designated them apostles he designated them now the word apostle as you mean sent one he designated them sent ones there's a clue there about the very dna of the community of god's people notice what jesus did he he was a sent one the first thing he did is gathered a community created a community from his mission
change your mind, which you know the word means repent. He came out of the wilderness saying, change your mind. The rule of God is coming to earth through me. And he gathered 12 disciples, followers who would learn from him, be like him, live like him and do mission like him. And he gave them a title and a, def a title to define their function. Apostles sent ones, but they were a community. This first church was had a had a definition of it being sent. And those 12 sent ones embedded the sending DNA of Christ and the kingdom into the foundations of the New Testament church. Christ, as we know, is not Jesus' second name. It's his title. It means anointed king. And by very nature of being anointed king, it means rulership. And the very nature of heavenly rulership and even ancient rulership is that rule didn't come by a vote and by a democracy. It came by a conquest. And Jesus, the anointed king, has come to conquer darkness, conquer death, not conquer sin, conquer destruction conquered Satan's worst. And in the conquering of this conquering king, he establishes a, the beautiful reign of God so that everything that comes under it may know flourishing, the flourishing of God, your kingdom come, your rule come, just as it is in heaven on earth. So the first priority is, is, is a mission. But there's also another priority that we see in Christ is that he's a builder. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And then we know as Paul went out, he says that God's people are founded, this building term founded on the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. And so there's this, this, there's this architectural grace and architectural wisdom and ministry that the apostolic priorities give themselves to. They give themselves to mission first and they embed it. But having done the mission, they have an architectural design where they, they, they create this community like Jesus did with the 12. And this community has an architectural, again, DNA to it or design to it that reflects the kingdom of heaven. The, the church is an ambassador, it's, it's an, an embassy of heaven. You know, in the ancient days, uh, before the word apostle was Christianized, um, they, in the Greek, uh, the word apostle represented when um, a nation would load up a ship, for example, with architects and lawyers and soldiers and farmers and artisans, and 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 laborers and uh, um and they would send them to another nation and they would send a community in this boat they would apostolize them send them to another nation to actually establish a community there that looked like home looked like home and god has sent jesus to establish a community that looks like home the kingdom the heaven's home the kingdom of heaven and then Jesus said to his apostles, now I send you as the father sends me. And they go with a message, a missional message, but they have this architectural design that creates a new humanity, a new people called the people of God that actually looks like an, a society from another world, heaven. And we are the ambassadorial representatives of heaven on earth and that's an architectural grace and it's an architectural design it's highly relational highly relational it's not just functional highly relational and it has an economy of love and its currency is faith and its currency is love and it's a grace that makes it happen so there's so so there's this third so so these apostolic priorities about mission and about this healthy healthy church, healthy community of God's people that rep, uh, rep, uh, represent the kingdom of heaven. And then the third apostolic priority, uh, very quickly, is, is reform. Um, the, the, if you look through the, the New Testament te letters, I would say, I mean, 90% of them are reformational. 
they are all Paul and his and the apostles are always calling God's people back to Christ, his mission and his kingdom. It always calling them back to alignment. You think of the Galatian church, oh, Galatian church, how who has bewitched you? You started off so well. Who cut in on your race? Wasn't Christ crucified before you? Why are you giving in to legalists? Why are you giving in to those Judaizers? Why are you giving to those who insist that the flesh must be circumcised rather than the heart? You started off in the spirit and you're now trying to be perfected in the flesh. Come back. And this is typical of the apostolic ministry where he's appealing. They're appealing to the church to come back. And so there's three priorities of this. These movements, these movements that prevail, they're missional at heart, not management, not protecting, missional at heart. And the challenge for the Western church is that we actually get back to being as a local church and a collective, a missional movement, because we're not a missional movement. We're a pastor teacher organization that disciples poorly. So basically, we're a pastor teacher organization that worship, which is singing songs, do mission rarely and discipleship poorly. That's predominantly the hallmarks of the Western church, where the culture and the and the the definition of what church should be is that we're a missional movement first. Without mission, there's nobody to pass. Without mission, there's nobody to teach. Without mission, there's nobody to disciple. Without mission, there's nobody to worship in the church or around the throne. Get mission right and everything else follows. And, and sometimes the clue that we have turned the church inside, inside itself, that it's become self-serving, is that... Uh, the titles that we give its leaders, nearly every single title in the Western church is pastor, which basically means a shepherd. And the co connotation of a shepherd is a shepherd of God's people, right? So we have, we have senior shepherds of God's people. We have worship shepherds, pastors of worship pastors, children's pastors, family pastors, even buildings pastors. And it's all about shepherding the people of God. And it's turned self, almost like self-serving. But the DNA of the apostolic church, first seen in Christ, first seen in those first disciples, sent ones, first embedded into the New Testament church, that they were missional movement first. And from the missional movement, all the other ministries flowed. The pastor, the teacher, it all flowed from there. But we've almost got the cart before the horse and, one, and wonder why we lose our prevailing power in our given generation. But the movements that actually keep to the missional priority and the architectural design, which reflects the kingdom of God, highly relational, and then has this reform where it keeps bringing it back to these priorities of mission and kingdom design of the church. They're the ones that keep their prevailing presence and power through any given generation. And some of these movements, they last more than decades. They can move into generations. And the ones and the, 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 uh, the, the, the networks or movements that begin to veer away, they, they begin to lose their prevailing impact over the course of time. So one of the lessons that we've been learning in Wales that has been surrounded by revival history is this, is that whilst the revival can be absolutely awesome, and I've been praying for revival again in our nation since I was converted in 1982, but if I would, despite it's known throughout the world, the revival is only known to church people and to the Christian historian who wants to delve into its history. But I would say this, if I walked outside my front door where I live in Dewin Llewellyn Road, which is on the stomping ground and the prayer ground of Reef Towels that were saved in the revival, if I went and spoke to my next door neighbor or my neighbor across the road or just down the road, say, can you tell me what you know about Evan Roberts and the Welsh revival? They'll go, who? They'll go, who? 
because the memory and the power and the presence of it is short-lived. But a movement, a movement sparked and inspired by it or by a call of God that adheres to the missional priorities of Christ, the architectural design of the kingdom, and is continually reforming, calling the, the church back to this priority, is graced with a prevailing power. So when Jesus said to his first apostles, who do men say I am? And Jesus and Peter says, well, some say this and some, some say, you know, John the Baptist come back from death. Yeah, but who do you say I am? And Peter said this, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, what he's saying is this, you are the Christ, you are the king. Remember, this isn't his surname. This is his title. You are the ruler, the son of the living God. In other words, you are God. You're a human being. You're sent from heaven. And you're the king bringing in the kingdom. You've got it. This missional kingdom sent from heaven. And, and Jesus said, bingo. Well, it's like Hebrew for well done, Peter. He said, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. You didn't get this from a textbook. You didn't get it from a sermon. You even didn't get it from your own mind. But my father in heaven he actually says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah, Jonah means dove. He's referring to the spirit. He says, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. And by saying Simon Bar-Jonah, son of the spirit or son of the dove, he's talking about the spirit of God from the father has revealed to you that I am the king, divine, clothed in humanity, sent from heaven to restore the kingdom. And he says, upon this rock, what rock? that you've just have a revelation that the king is here to bring in the kingdom. I will build my church and nothing on earth will prevail against it. You see, the secret to the prevailing church is the foundation that Christ, the anointed king, the messianic king, has come from heaven to bring a missional movement. Am I communicating? Yes. Okay. Just making sure, because you're very quiet out there, because you're all on mute. <laughs> okay. So what I'd, I'd like to fast forward now, if, if you don't mind, um, to three things in the last 15 minutes and 49 seconds I've got. Uh, fast forward to three things that God has been doing in Wales, this land of revivals. I was interested to speak to Steve yesterday. And uh, Steve, I think a little bit might like me, is very reluctant to coin the word revival because it can mean all different things to different people. So, so um, I certainly would say there's an awakening going on. But three things that God is doing in Wales right now. Over the last 14 years, there has been developing a apostolic missional unity movement uh, it started with seven leaders uh, sarah myself sarah's my wife myself a good friend of mine uh, bruce collins who's a very close partner with me in the ministry uh, a number of other leaders that we all knew we've known each other for many years i've been in wales about 20 years at this time and we knew each other we're friends we but we never really got the chance to work collaboratively together because we all had our own churches and we were all very busy. But we came together and uh, we began to ask this question. And my friend Bruce uh, initiated this. He, he said he began to ask this question. What is God doing in Wales and what should our response be? And as we prayed and talked, we we really began to believe that God wanted to bring another move of his spirit in Wales, but we needed to position ourselves for it as the church and prepare for it as the church, that it wouldn't just be a flashing the pan and a come and go, but that it was a movement that would continue very much like the apostolic church movement continued. And we are the recipients and the beneficiaries of that 
sitting in our Zoom rooms today. Because it was not just an upper room experience, but it translated into a move of God that took the globe. And so we felt that God wanted to prepare the church. And so we 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 formed a leadership, we formed a network. <laughs> and there was only seven of us. But we we went around the nation, we vision cast what we felt God wanted to do, because at that time, 14 years ago, there was only 2% of the population were born again. People didn't want to go to church and they didn't like Christians. And when you began to share your faith, you could sense a hostility. They didn't want to know. When we started our church, people threw, you know, smashed the windows in our house where we started it. We had our house burgled 16 times, our car stolen a whole bunch of times as well. And it was really, really tough because secularism had bit and people weren't interested at all. And in both in civic society and the person down the street, they didn't like church and they didn't like Christians. And so we knew we had to do something. And in the last 17 years, what God has done, he has developed a apostolic unity movement. And I want to talk about the unity and the apostolic. So now we have 700 leaders and 206 churches and 22 denominations and church streams working together right across the nation on a continuous collaborative strategic basis. And we've been doing that for many, many years. We've got nine regions and they've got apostolic teams leading the regions. The leaders as apostolic teams form the national team. We have our national conferences. We have leadership pathways. And these are our focuses. We de develop leaders to build healthy churches that do mission well. So it's like those apostolic priorities. It's developing leaders to build healthy churches that do mission well. Right now, we're in the middle of an intensive program of helping as many churches as possible across Wales to become cultures of mission. Cultures of mission rather than pastor, teacher, centered churches. Yes, we do pastor. Yes, we do teach. Yes, we do worship. But we have to have mission first. Otherwise, everything else dries up and we, re we, we lose our prevailing presence and power because that DNA is lost from the foundation of the church. So we're, we're apostolic movement because we are mission focused. We, we are looking to develop healthy kingdom churches that do mission well. I remember Clem coming to us the very first leaders conference that we were going to do with this network and uh, only around about 100 leaders uh, were booked in because it was in its early days of so the very first one and uh, Clem stood before Sarah and myself we pioneered Cornerstone Church together and in front of our congregation the eve before the conference he prophesied over us and what came out of his mouth was a surprise to me because I was expecting we were going to go leadership church and mission in in tomorrow's conference and he said Psalm 113 133 as the as the community of god's people dwell together in unity i'm going to bring an anoint brings an anointing upon the head of aaron and that represents leadership i'm summarizing now and an anointing of god is coming upon the unit upon god's leaders in wales who have a shared purpose and the anointing is going to come down and it's going to bring a unity right across the churches across wales and it's going to be and the intensity of that unifying oil will be as thick on the fringe of the garment as it is on the head of the leaders so even those who are on the margins and now feel excluded will feel included did. And when we went the following day some, to the leadership conference, something extraordinary happened that, to be perfectly honest with you, I did not expect. A love from heaven filled the room. And there was a unity and a love that was birthed and imparted and has never left, and it's grown and grown and grown. And now, across the denominations of Wales, we have churches from all different streams and the hallmark of it is not that we don't speak wrongly against each other or we don't criticize one another from the pulpit that's not unity that's just repentance the hallmark of it is love and uh, and and love is is a hallmark of the trinitarian unity and trinitarian unity 
has a, a distinguishing feature that is absolutely so beautiful. And it's this, it champions one another. So when Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, the father said to the crowd, to those who could hear, this is my son and I love him and I like him a lot. Listen to him. And then Jesus says, listen, everybody, I only say what I hear the father saying and I only do what I see I doing. Basically, look at him. And then he says to the disciples, listen, boys, it's really good that I'm going to leave you. <laughs> what do you mean? You don't want the main stage, Jesus? No, it's really good that I'm going to leave you. Because if I don't go, the, the, the advocate, the Holy Spirit won't come. But if I go, I will ask the Father and he'll send you the Holy Spirit. And do you see how... The Father champions Jesus. Jesus champions the Father. And the Holy Spirit takes the things of God and reveals them to us. Mm -hmm. And Jesus champions the Spirit. And this is Trinitarian unity. It's not just let's be kind to each other and stop gossiping and stop saying horrible things and do a few things together. Trinitarian unity is when you love one another so much, you cheer one another, you prefer one another, you champion one another, and you do everything you can to make them win. There you go. And that's what we're experiencing in Wales. And it is sacred and beautiful. So there's this, this unity mission that has grown and getting momentum over the last 14 years. Six minutes and one second to go. The other thing that's happening, as a result of our mission, we are seeing... Um, healings taking place all over the nation now in our own church we've seen healings uh take place for about the last 20 years uh there was a time sarah and i always would pray for sick people and the times when we saw people healed was always in the context of mission uh but in our church we would pray for people and you know i don't think we'd be able to see a, a rabbit heal with a headache. You know, it was just, you would more you see more people not healed than you prayed for. But when we turned it outwards and we began to pray for our friends outside the church who didn't know Jesus, people at the bus stop, people down the street, people in the workplace, people that we met every day with the aches and pains and ailments, short term, long term, and we prayed for them, they began to get healed. And we can, and people would, and what we did, we went on a journey of equipping our church members to pray for their non-Christian friends. And they would go out, pray for their non-Christian friends. So it wasn't the superstars or the ministries or the platforms. Or the I mean, obviously we'd jump in and be an example, but we were equipping others and they went out and they would come back and tell their stories. And we found a multiplication of people getting healed. I remember, I mean, let me just tell you one or two stories. Uh, there was uh, one uh, girl who was a family member of our church. She was working in a nursing home and one of her colleagues got ill. By the way, I'm speaking quickly because I've only got four minutes, 20 seconds to go. And um, so, so she was ill for about six, you know, six weeks. She had actually had an abscess in her stomach. It was draining all her energy. She had no energy. She couldn't, she wasn't getting out of bed for about six weeks. She wasn't eating. She was in a really, really, really bad way. And uh, so she went to her home, this uh, girl from our church, knocked on her door, went upstairs to her room, prayed for her, and she got healed and all the energy returned. She just said a simple prayer, and this was the prayer she prayed. Healing belongs to you because of what Jesus had done. Because of the cross, receive your healing. And all the energy she got, she got up, she went downstairs. Her daughter was in the house. She said, what's happened to you, ma'am? That's what they call mothers in Wales, ma'am. They went happened to you, ma'am? She said, I've been healed. She said, well, if you've been healed, jump up and down, because she knew she had no energy. She was jumping up and down. At that point, her husband returned. Now, her husband, who had been uh, working out, and he returned in his gym gear, and his husband's a really, really nice man. He loves playing football, but he's got a lifetime ban for violence on the football pe on the football pitch, the soccer pitch. I mean, he's a really nice man. I and mean, he's got scars on his scars from where he's been in scraps and fight. Um, and he's also had a real reputation for road rage. I don't know if you have it where you are, but it's when somebody cuts you up and you get so mad, you chase after them in the car and you either beat the living daylights out of them or you smash their car up, one or the other. But 
you know, apart from that lovely chap, you'd really like him. So he came home and his wife was there and he saw his wife standing in the middle of the room. <laughs> and he looked at her and he said, you look radiant. What's happened to you? And his wife said, I'm not going to give his name, so I must be careful. His, his, wife, his wife said, I've been healed. And he said to me, because they turned up in church the following week, he said, he said to me, Julian, when my wife said, I've been healed, the first thought that went through my mind is this, oh no, there is a God. <laughs> so I shared the gospel with him. He gave his life to Christ. They left. Following week, they turn up at church. He came up to me and says, Julian, your life, my life changed when we prayed that prayer at the end of the service last week because I left the church car park in my car. Somebody cut me up. And I went, oh, no, you silly Billy. <laughs> His life was changed. But we, have, we are seeing healings of this nature and other forms of healing all the time. I was in the, at the hairdressers uh, some time ago having a haircut and uh, the girl who's cut my hair disappeared and she'd gone missing for about three minutes and there I am with half a haircut and there's a whole guy in the, in the hairdressers waiting to be having their hair cut and then she turned to me and says, oh, Julian, I can't carry on cutting your hair. Uh, three months ago, I fell over a walking stick and I've damaged my cartilage and my limp, uh, ligament. I can't limp around your, uh, this seat any longer. I just can't carry on cutting your hair. And I, because I go to the same hairdressers regularly, because, you know, I, I said, listen, you know, you, I've told you about how when we pray for people, they get healed and they get healed of pain, just like your God. Would you like me to pray for you now to be healed? Don't close your eyes. You don't have to do anything religious. Uh, uh, it's, it'll take about, I know, 10 seconds. Would you like me to pray for you? And people who are in pain always say this. They go, yes, please. And I said, okay, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, heal me now with a comb in one hand, head cut, <laughs> scissors in the other. She said, Lord Jesus, you know, a lovely Welsh accent. Lord Jesus, please heal me now. And I said, Father, I thank you that you love this lady. I pray you'll heal her and I command your knee to be healed in Jesus' name. Move it now and see if it's any better. She moved her knee and she went, moved her knee. And she went, oh, that's stunning, that is. She was totally, <laughs> all the pain had gone. And so she, I mean, she was blown away. Uh, so I went, when I went back to see her about six weeks later for my other haircut, I said, how's your knee? And she said, um, Julian, I cried for three days after that. God was just moving so powerfully in her life. Now, we have seen so many healings across Wales and churches now embracing healing, not just our church, but churches out there in the community uh, because it's be now you, we see people healed in the church and outside the church. There's no difference now because the culture, we've got a healing culture. It's flown back in like Ecclesiastes. Cast your bread upon the water and in many days it will return, comes back. So we've seen so many people healed. My daughter has done a, had to do a PhD on healing miracles in Wales. She went to a secular college. God told her not to study theology, but go to a secular college. So she did this secular college with all these secularists and in the philosophical, philosophical and religious department. And they let her do a PhD on healing miracles in Wales now. And it just blew them away, you know. So she's catalogued all these hundreds of stories and identified the, the distinguishing marks of the churches and how this happened. It's an amazing thing. So we've seen unity and, and um, healing. So can I just steal five more minutes to wrap it up? Absolutely. Go sure? for it. Because I, I can finish. Uh, but uh, you can miss it. Go, so, go. Okay. So we, we've seen a move of unity around mission. Developing leaders to build healthy churches that does mission well. Um, the third healing and the third thing we're seeing God do is create a spiritual openness to Jesus amongst the lost. Now, this is it. Secularism has bitten hard in the UK, but God, right underneath our noses, through all the turmoil and the darkness and the chaos, and the despair of human life in a crazy world that's going on right now, he has moved upon it to open the hearts of people to Jesus. So in 2013, 
yeah, 2013, I was going for a walk around Belindra Reservoir. I grab a coffee and go for a walk there. It's where I, it's where I go and uh, try to listen to God. And uh, I, I felt the Lord say to me, Julian, change your clothes. It's a new season. And I knew exactly what he was saying. Um, for, for, for all of my Christian life, uh, in a secular society, whenever we've shared the gospel, we've um, come up against a mild resistance or antagonism or hostility, uh, sometimes physical hostility. I mean, I've actually had people try to blink and throw bricks at me, but anyway, we won't go into that. But um, so a mild hostility. So what this does for every good hearted Christian who's shared the gospel with their friends and their work colleagues, and they've just lost their friends, been ridiculed and and felt the hostility. It has robbed them of confidence that the gospel actually has power. And it also has created a low level fear. So they've stopped sharing their faith. Low level fear. So they stopped sharing their faith. And then we've moved into friendship evangelism. But actually, all it's been is friendship. Because people are being frightened to share their faith. And I fully and completely understand that. And I've had to battle that myself. But in 2013, I felt God said, change your clothes. There's a new season. And the clothes represented mindsets. That's what they represent in Scripture. And they, they mindset. Change your mindset. It's a new season. And I knew the Lord was saying that the new season of openness in people's hearts. You haven't seen it, but I'm telling you it's there. So then in 2015, a group of people, uh, organizations, commissioned a survey called the Talking Jesus Survey. And they began to um, survey the reactions of non-Christians who'd had a conversation with Jesus in recent years. It was 2015, this was. And to their astonishment, they discovered that now one in five people who had a conversation about Jesus wanted to know more about him or have an encounter with him. One in five. Now, you wouldn't get one in five. You wouldn't get one in a hundred 20 years ago. You just wouldn't, God, you just wouldn't have it. it was, I mean, totally, totally hostile. So... <clears throat> We were sensing this thing because when we're praying for people and asking our friends if they would if they would allow us to pray for them or even total strangers, uh, could we pray for them to be healed? They would all say yes. That we we're noticing that there was an openness. We we were struggling to find the last time we prayed, offered somebody prayer, and they said no. I'm talking about non-Christians now. So I remember I'm in, I'm, I'm in a local shop. And uh, Sarah's in the changing room uh, trying some some clothes. It's our, our day off, and we're in Cardiff, and I was just waiting there. And I heard the shopkeeper say to her friend, oh, I've just damaged my ankle down the gym, and I'm struggling carrying these boxes up the stairs and load them onto the shelves. And she was complaining because she was really, really struggling. And as she walked past, I said, es excuse me, I, 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 I'm not, I don't mean to be nose or ear, but I couldn't help overhearing you've damaged your ankle you know, what's happened, how bad it is. She explained how painful and difficult it was. Now, I've never met this woman in my life. And I said, look, I know this sounds unusual, but in my church, we pray for people and they often get healed. I can't promise it, but would you like me to pray for you? Because I wouldn't be surprised if, if God healed you. And you know what she went? This is what she went, right? She went, go for it. That is, that's what, that's the common response. Go for it. So there I am in the shop. I said, what's your name? She says, Michelle. I said, Michelle, I, would you pray this prayer? Jesus, heal me now. She said, Lord, Lord Jesus, please heal me now. I said, Father, thank you, love Michelle. I command your knee, your ankle to be healed. Move it. Uh, Michelle, see if it's any better. As simple as that. And she goes, oh, and it got, she got totally healed. She goes, what did she say? She said, oh, you can come again. I mean, she didn't give me a discount for the clothes that we bought, but she was healed. So, so what I'm trying to say is, it, it people are saying yes to what we offer when we begin to share faith. So we were noticing this. So in 2017, we decided to do a mission-wide Wales. So in all of our network churches, not all of them, we could we had 123 churches joined in over about 13 locations in Wales. And we went out onto the streets, the people who we never met before, and talked to them about Jesus for one hour. 
And so we would go onto the streets and say, excuse me, um, my name's June. I'm with some friends from my church. I'm just here to let you know that God loves you and has got a wonderful plan for your life. Now, if I'd done that 15, 20 years ago, I would have got a whole load of abuse. But to our surprise, in light of the statistics and the survey and our experience, they said, oh, thank you very much. And then we would say, um, if you were to die tonight, would you be sure of going to heaven? And they go, do you know, I don't know if I would. And then we would say, would you like me to explain to you what the Bible says about heaven and how to get there? And they go, yes, please. And then we would say, well, actually, the Bible says, says um, all of sin that comes short of God's perfect standard. And they go, oh, yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> They're not disagreeing. They go, yes, that's right. Yeah, we're all, we're all like that. Yes. And our sin separates us from God. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand that. But Jesus, and when we begin to share the gospel, and then after we shared the gospel, we'd offer if we could pray a prayer of blessing. And nearly everybody said yes. And then after that, we said, would you like to receive Jesus Christ, as we've been talking about, as your Lord and Savior, and, and lead them in a prayer of repentance? Well, we went out for nine days, for one hour a day. 300 people came to Christ every hour. Every hour. Every, every hour. I had pastors. They were weeping because they said, we've never seen anything like this. We, they were in because you know what it's like. You work so hard. And it's so painful sometimes working so hard and seeing so little for your labors and your fruit, especially in the second issue. They were weeping with tears. We had people going out on the streets in the first day, crying with fear, like lambs amongst wolves, crying with fear, coming back so happy and astonishing. And we would see whole families come to Christ on the streets. And then there were people, I remember... The old, it was really, really easy with the young. We didn't go up to anybody under 18. Uh, only if they were obviously 18, we would do it. From the 18s to the 35s, they were coming. To, it was like fishing in a barrel. The older, particularly older men, it was a little bit more, you know, 60 plus. But I remember one guy coming towards me in a walking stick. And I said, oh, I'm just here with my friends to let you know God loves you. Well, I'm not interested in any of that, you know, old school. And, uh, and I said, oh, I can see you're in a lot of pain with your stick. I know this sounds strange, but in our church, we pray for people. They often get healed. We want me to pray for you. Well, he's in pain. He says, yes, I pray for him. He gets healed. And then he comes to Christ. So this was something we see, we're seeing. Whole, I, I haven't got time because I'm over my time to, to speak to you about it. But um, then in the, after COVID, obviously, we did that up to COVID. And, and the stats went from 3,700 to over to nearly 5,000 people responding to Christ on the streets because we did it at a, at a rhythm people could do. Um, then in 22, they redid the survey. And the stats went from one in five people open to Christ to one in three. Now, there's 60 people. There's 60 million people in where in, in the UK. That means 20 million people are open for a conversation to God and having an encounter with Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm gonna wrap this up. The challenge. A couple of years ago, before my kids had proper grown up, they were teenagers, but you know, and they hadn't left home and gone to university and got married. We're all sitting around the dinner table and I sit on the end of the dinner table and there's the fridge there and the kids were here and my wife Sarah was over there and she said, oh, would you, get the, would you get the butter from the fridge? So I got up and I opened the fridge and looked, and there's no butter, close to the fridge, so there's no, there's no butter there. And she said, oh, yes, there is. Yeah, there is. Can you have another look? Oh, so I opened the fridge, I had a look. Oh, no, there's no butter. She said, yes, there is. Go have another look. Oh. So I got open up and I go and have that. No, nope, there's no butter. I mean, I stared really hard this time. I know butter. And I said it, I don't know, I, I said it in a tone. <laughs> I said it in a tone that says, I didn't say this, but it had a tone that says, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so Sarah, she left the seat, she opened the fridge, and like putting a, pulling a rabbit out of a magician's hat, she produces the butter. Of course, that's never happened to you, is it? 
No, I can see. And I said, I said, what is that? So here's the thing. There is a, the, the problem was, i tell you what the problem was, why I didn't see it. I was looking at, in the middle shelf and the butter was five inches on the shelf below, above it. Five inches. If I'd looked five inches higher, I would have seen it. But because I was expecting the butter to be in a certain place and it wasn't in a certain place and the way I expected it, I didn't see it, although it was right before my eyes. Now, there's a psychological term for this. There's been a lot of research on it. It's called inattentional blindness. And inattentional blindness is when you expect something to happen in a certain way or be in a certain place. But if it is, if it's not, you can't see what's before your eyes because it's not happening or in the place that you expect. Let me ask you this question. <clears throat> what if God was moving by his spirit in the nations of the world, but it's not in the place where we expect? What if there was a revival taking place right before our very eyes, but it's not where we've seen it before? What if it was like the religious Pharisees and scribes who were expecting and looking for the Messiah to come in a certain way, in a certain place. They were expecting the Messiah to turn up, to reinforce their religious systems, to reinforce their religious institutions and practices. But the Messiah that they expected was unexpected. He was the expected, unexpected Messiah. They were expecting him. They studied the scripture. They had the history, but he turned up outside the paradigms and the religious systems of the day. And because he didn't reinforce their religious systems, he didn't reinforce what they were expecting. They couldn't see what they were longing for, praying for before their very eyes. What if there is a revival, for want of a word, an outpouring, a move of God, an activity of God right now in our nations. But we can't see it because it's outside of our churches, because all we've ever known is revivals where people pour in. But what right now is this across the globe? Because the chaotic world, the spirit of God has been hovering over the chaotic darkness of the global crises and the hearts of people open and it's a move of God, but we haven't seen it and we don't know how to respond to it and we haven't prepared for it and we're not moving out missionally because we're expecting God to do something that people will pour in. You see, when I, I was speaking to the, I was speaking to the um, chief exec of the Bible, British and Foreign Bible Society, he's, it's a massive missional movement. He's also a professor of missiology in Regents uh, College, uh, Theological College uh, in Canada. And he is um, a professor of research and, and he's, he's a researcher as well. Uh, his background is in market mission and he was in um, finance until he went into becoming a professor of theology. And the Bible Society have done a survey on spiritual openness that that is taking place not just in the uk now but around the globe and he was and i was and he was, i was having a meeting with him because we're partners with our missional movement and the bible society and he said to me julian there has not been this spiritual openness in the uk uh that, that we had in the last 40 years but it's not just in the uk it's around the globe they're doing research around the globe and they're saying that there is a global phenomenon a spiritual openness in the nations right now but it's outside the church outside the church so here's the challenge revivals have been a spark to movements and it's the movements that have had the long-term prevailing effect. Movements that go, movements that create spiritual architectures, uh, churches that have the architecture of heaven, and movements that are continually making sure that we're reflecting those priorities. What if 
the revival that you and I have been praying for is, is, is right before our eyes. But it's just five, five inches above our spiritual horizon. And it's outside the doorstep of the church and our religious systems. And it's time to actually mobilize. And what if, what if the openness is not just amongst the few, but amongst the big fish, the masses, the masses. I mean, 20 million people in the UK open. And we're talking about millions. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking this is me true of the states. We're talking about millions of people are open to Christ. Let me tell you this. There isn't a church, there isn't a network that could actually be a net that's big enough. It could be like going out into the deep waters and them having to call their partners because the nets are breaking. What if God is calling for us to have a united apostolic missional unity movement that's defined by love? prioritizes the mission of Christ, not just for our town, not just for our region, but for our nation and the nations of the world. What if God is doing something so extraordinary that it takes a humility of churches and church leaders to unite together for a bigger harvest, for a bigger net mission, and we could see the greatest move of God that history has ever known in our day? That's what I'm believing for. Um, that's the call uh, of why I felt challenged to write the book, Apostolic Priorities. It's a story of Wales. It's got a theology of the kingdom of God. It's wrapped in story. It's a resource for church leaders and their teams. And it's put in a language that it is, appeals to pastors, uh, church leaders, but also for those most neglected people in the church who may never have a title, may never have a ministry position, but they're there every Sunday, believing with you, working for you, serving in the church. If you have the leaders, you have the teams, and you have those core pillars, you've got the church, and you can transition a church from being a pastoral model into a missional movement that actually has a hope from heaven and on earth to get the job done. And as Bugs Bunny said <laughs> at the end of his cartoon, that's it, folks. That's all I've got to say. Uh, wow. Thank you, Julian. Obviously, we're hearing from the Lord here, and there's so much, uh, so many thoughts I've already written down. I have to just ponder. Uh, what I would like to do now <clears throat> is start with uh, Michael, Steve, and Rich. Uh, followed up with Clem. Clem's been with Julian so so much, and uh, and whatever particular question you may have, we're, we're not, you know, now when we open it up for sharing, we're, we're not after little mini sermons or super commentary. You know, just pointed questions to Julian. Uh, if you want to reference something, that's fine. But uh, yeah, brother, that was. Very good. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I'm convicted, encouraged. <laughs> Michael, I'm going to start with you. If you have something on your heart. Well, I do. Julian, love that. M Michael Cotton here. Um, Hi, Michael. Nice to see you. Good to see you, brother. I, I loved your comments about Trinitarian unity. I've never heard that phrase. But the Holy Spirit has just been uh, dealing with me for several years now. And I think with all five of us about this very thing about preferring others more than yourself. And, and uh, I just sense a move of God there. And wish maybe if you could just talk a few minutes about that and how y'all will see that happen and what's happening with. Uh, uh, groups or churches that used to have a historical animus toward each other. Mm. What have you seen? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, honor Clem, if I may. <clears throat> uh, he prophesied something. Um, and if you think, you, you know, when it talks about the church being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, I think the Old Testament prophets pointed to Christ, the New Testament apostles and prophets witnessed 
to Christ and we follow in their footsteps. And when Clem prophesied that God was going to bring a unity of leaders amongst around the purpose, I felt I, I can see now, you often learn in hindsight, not at the time, uh, I have to be honest, that wasn't on my agenda. My agenda was very functional. You know, <laughs> let's get this job done. Each of church mission, you know, train leaders, do church as well, but get the job done. Yeah. But Clem yeah. prophesied something and he prophesied a grace into, and this is what prophets do, don't they? They prophesied a grace into the foundations of the movement. And it imparted something there and, and we received it and God honored it. And something happened, but I think our stewardship of it, if I could put it that way, was to recognize it and say, no, we're not just going to become a get the job done movement. We're going to become a re highly relational movement. And so we, it, there's choices to humble yourself. I don't think any of us are very humble, to be honest. I think we're quite fallen, quite self selfish and quite self-opinionated. I think humility isn't something innate you know, until the Lord returns. I think it's something you have to choose and sometimes with gritted teeth, you know, and, you know, okay, I am not going to respond yet, you know, and and it, you have to cultivate a humility that honours people. And what we have found over the years, uh, the leaders, the leaders around the network, they have chosen to go the humble path. They've chosen to go the self-sacrificial path. Let me just be absolutely honest, honest with you. And I mean this most sincerely. I, I in our team, I have the most amazing leaders. Ama there's some of our bigger churches than than the church that uh, Sarah and I have had privilege to found, and um, amazing leaders, amazing. And they let me lead. Why do they let me lead? Because of humility. Any one of them could lead it. They could lead it better than me, but they choose. It's humility. So it's something that you recognize. It's something you choose, something you guard, something you protect. So when a, somebody comes up to, to um, uh, comes into our church from another church, I'm thinking, oh, that's a problem. I don't really want you to join our church. If you're non-Christian, you get said, I want you to come to be decided, but I don't really want an, another transfer growth because I've got a church down the road who's my brother and my sister who are leading that church. And it means that they're depleted and I get something. I don't want that. I just don't want that. I have chosen as, 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 as a church, uh, we have chosen as a network, we facilitate and we support church planting. Uh, we really do. Uh, but as a church, we've chosen because we, we're the lead network church, not to church plant. Because if I church plant in another city, then I'm church planting uh, where my other brothers and sisters are working, a part of our network. Right. So, 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 so now it's going to it's going to make their job harder. What's the point of doing that? If they're my brother and I'm new with them in our same unity stream and i want them to succeed why do i do that unless we're going to offer something actually unique that they actually recognize is needed and welcome us into the city or i go and church plant into a village or a town where there is no church so it, it actually causes us to make some really brave sacrificial decisions and as as you live out these lives over the course of the years and i'll finish on this thing it begins to mature the love of god matures the grace of god matures the clarity of focus and it becomes less self-serving and more cultivating your environment for the flourishing of others um and of course uh, we do it very poorly we do, we do it very poorly, you know, don't believe the press. We do it very, very poorly, but we are committed to limping along this road. Amen. Does that help in any way? Yes, it does, Julian. Thanks so much. Steve, Steve you have something on your heart? No, I was just uh, wanting to make sure, Julian, that you pray for us before we end this uh, Zoom call, because I... We all sense the anointing on you, and I believe that there will be an impartation 
if you would pray for us. So that's all I'm going to ask is make sure that you uh, pray for all of us before the call ends. Good, good, good comment, Steve. Uh, Rich? Gal? No, I don't have anything to add. I'm just uh, ruminating on all the thoughts that you had. I guess the only thing I'll say is, you know, I moved from the United States to Canada and I've always said that there is a American force field that church leaders and church planters live under. That's so powerful. And you have to be outside of that American force field to get a larger, larger picture of what God is doing. And like Clem said at the outset, <clears throat> it's so helpful to hear what God is saying to leaders around the world. I do a lot of um, ministry in Asia of course, I've been in Canada, and you just see that there's a global intelligence that God has given to the body of Christ around the world, and we need to really hear from one another to get the fullness of God's wisdom. So you're definitely contributing to that. That Many other things to say, but time's short. Yeah, can I make a comment about that, um, <clears throat> Rich? In two, around about 2004, I had, I had a dream, and I, I had this dream of, the, I saw a picture of the globe in the dream, and there were uh, these blue whales, which would represent the biggest fish in the sea, and they were blue whales. And um, when I when I say they represent apostolic ministry, what what I what I mean by that is is it's not like apostolic personalities or people like some of their big fish, because I don't think they. I think their foundation layers, you know, others build upon the you know uh, uh, on the. The, the the basically the hole that they dug in the ground so i don't mean it that way but they represent an apostolic mindset which includes all the Ephesians four ministries but what they were doing they were circling the globe these big whales and they were speaking to one another around the globe through sonar because that's the language they they communicate through thousands and hundreds of miles around the globe and they could all understand one another's language it's like an apostolic language this apostolic dna that we first saw in christ and the early apostles that was embedded into the whole of the church and as they as they understood it and they were all in the zone of it they moved with with perfect synchronicity closing in on the landmass for global mission there was not one who was ahead of the other, superior to the other, leading to the other. The synchronicity came because of they understood the language of one another. And I feel that what, what the Lord is doing is creating a apostolic missional language and understanding that we first is decoded through Christ. It's the, you know, it's the code, it's, it's Christ sonar. Christ, the spirit of Christ. And as we begin to speak it, and I think we're speaking it now, you know, you get the resonance of it, one another chatting, and, and it and it by very nature causes a a synchronicity of the body of Christ to move towards this global mission. Amen. Um, absolutely. We could we could talk for a long time <laughs> along these lines. We'll have a conversation. And another time for sure, Julian. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna we have a, a few minutes for some questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Clem. Just want to take a minute to. We all hate self promotion, so I'll promote Julian on my behalf. His book, Apostolic Priorities. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what Julian shared is in more in depth in his book. He just kind of gave the cliff notes, but it's a. Great study. He has great insight to fivefold ministry, which we all love and want to know how it's going to operate. And uh, the only other thing, Joni, if you take one minute and then we'll, you can pray for us, talk about the the concept of how New Wine Wales, two hundred, you know, churches is non governmental. The non I think that's kind of stumbling. <laughs> that's, yeah. Oh, by the way, this my wife Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Give us a wave. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, just talk about touch on that for one minute, Jules. Because um, it's okay, important. when you look, when you think about government, when you talk about apostolic ministry, often all of those of you who are uh, network leaders uh, will your brains can start going a bit twitchy because you think, well, how can you have unity and be apostolic? Because apostolic is governmental. 
okay that's it you know and and if but and and, and it's difficult to have unity and have a governmental network because you have to you would have to leave your denomination or your stream to join it because you're moving from one government to another however when when we uh, track through Paul's journey we see that there are two modes of operation with the apostolic there's governmental and non-governmental and Paul moved between the two of them through all the churches that Paul personally founded Ephesus Corinth Philippi Galatia so forth you'll see that he he was highly governmental um you know, he said to the Corinthian church, look, there's a problem in this church. If you don't sort it out, I'll come and sort it out for you. You know, very more highly governmental than most of us would choose to be, I think. Very governmental. But when he wanted to visit the Roman church that he didn't found, he approached the Roman church with his full apostolic credentials and his full apostolic grace and ministry offering it to the church. But he didn't come from a governmental operating system so he says to the roman church you can read it for yourselves you probably read it a load of times i paul an apostle appointed set apart by god from birth to proclaim the gospel of christ and he talks about his apostolic credentials and he says to the roman church i have been longing and hoping to come to you that I may give a grace, I may give a grace to you, a gift, a grace. It's not a governmental, I want to grace you with something. And I want to receive, and I'm hoping that I may receive a grace back to you, that we may be mutually strengthened. So you can, you can receive all of my apostolic wisdom, all of my apostolic grace, all of my ap apostolic experience, all that God has downloaded to me. I am offering it to you as a grace, not as a brand not to control not to tell not to have governance over you but i want to grace you with it freely freely that you may receive and be strengthened and i want to receive from you so there's a recognition as a reciprocity there's a mutuality there and and it doesn't diminish his apostolic download or effectiveness but it's just a different operating system so we're we, we have a number of operating systems. There are some networks, they're church planting networks, denominations. They, are, they have their own operating system, which is governmental. But as a unity, an apostolic unity movement, we operate non-governmental. So we have apostles. We have ap all of our teams across the regions are apostolic. Our national apostolic team, we're serving churches, we're empowering churches, we're helping church plants but we're operating from a non-governmental point of view. And that enables other denominations to receive from us and we receive from them to move in mission and unity, but it is fully apostolic. Now, the only way you can get an apostolic, God is speaking, I think God has been speaking three voices across the earth in this present decade. Uh, one is unity, two is mission, three is the apostolic. Now, we, we have been in a prophetic renewal season, but that a prophetic renewal system is pr primarily preparing the church for what's coming next. Restora a restoration of the gifts, a restoration of the spirit, a restoration within the body of Christ. But then it's shifting now from a prophetic renewal to a missional renewal, and it's around apostolic unity and mission. But there's only way that those strands can become one chord, like a threefold chord. It's if you have a non-governmental approach because if you're governmental you can't, you can't you have to leave your stream to join in if you're not apostolic you can't you're not missional and missional and apostolic and missional brings a grace of unity because all one it's this architecture it has a grace to restore the relational trinitarian love of the church is an architecture it comes from an apostolic grace so much of paul's teaching was about unity and how we live as much as what we say so that's non-government and it's in the book and you can read it for yourself thanks clem somebody out there that has a has a, a question raise your hand so i can see that hand anyone before we have Julian pray for us. 
I, one thing I'm I'm just so blessed that this is recorded. I don't know about you. <laughs> Fred has Fred Fred raised his hand, Chuck. Okay, Fred, you'll Hi, have Fred. to unmute yourself there, Fred. My question is, do we have to have a new wineskin to be able to move into what you're discussing? Um, I think we have to have a new mindset. Okay. So, so let me explain. If, if, if um, okay, first of all, forgive me if my answers are being a little bit too black and white and predictive. All very nuanced, and you know, so forgive me for that. Um, but we work with historic churches, Baptist churches, Anglican churches. I mean, they are like almost millions of years old. We work with the new churches. We're working with churches that have just been birthed. And they're all working together. So, so we have to have a mindset and, and work work in a sense of we have to talk about principles rather than models, principles rather than models. So they can take the principles of the kingdom mm -hmm. and say, okay, how does this translate now into the, the, the denomination or the network that God has called me to build and me to work? And how do I tr transition my work into a missional movement and of course there's going to have to be a flexible one so it's going to have to be flexible because if you're not flexible there's no change but it's not about structures first of all it's about mindsets so the way that we think and i think god is bringing a re a, 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 a renewing of a changing of our paradigms like operating systems and it's the way that we think about the kingdom the way we think about church the way we think about mission the way we think about one another and we think about the global the global field and the global harvest great question it's about yeah thank you I have, I have a question uh julian it's tommy uh Hi, I wanted to know about like the healing culture in your church and in the network. How do you facilitate that by training different believers, all walks of life, different things like that, and have a culture of healing? But I know from your stories, like it's in everyday life, like the gym at the at the at the garage, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked about this, so I just wanted you know to know more about that. How to create a culture of healing to be missional in a church or a network, and how to apply that and train people. Okay, well, the, the the first thing is 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 to encourage people to take healing outside of the church into their friends and neighbors. It's much easier to see non-Christians healed, non-religious, unbelieving people healed, believe it or not, than it is to pray for Christians because they don't have the baggage that we have. Um, I think uh, we, we do need to give them a simple model. Um as, so it's a bit like when you're sharing your faith, you need to train to people how to share the gospel and lead people to Christ simply. It's not a formula, but it helps if you can give them a model. And so we provide a very simple model. And we found this, that if you provide a, a model that works for non-Christians, it will work for Christians in the church. But if you, if you just have a model that works for Christians in the church, it usually freaks the living daylights out of Christians, non-Christians outside the church, and it doesn't work. Uh, we have to it, we, you know, think with the non-Christian might, and it works both ways, but it doesn't always flow the other way back. Secondly, um, uh, church leaders, okay, church leaders need to model uh, healing and press into it. You couldn't be on Jesus' leadership team unless you healed the sick. You know, when Jesus discipled his disciples, he just didn't teach them how to live well and how to think right and theology. He spent three years teaching them how to move in the miraculous because we serve a miraculous kingdom. We serve a kingdom from another world and it's invading this world. And he spent three years teaching his disciples how to move in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus modeled it. And as church leaders, we have to model it. And if church leaders don't take this seriously and model it, and the congregation see them model it, and they go and tell their stories and teach it, and these are the hallmarks that we see in my daughter's PhD of, of churches that have this healing culture, starts with the leaders as it started with our leader, Jesus. 
you know, he came out of the wilderness, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, got 12 disciples, watch me do it, you do it. Now off you go, report back, and I'll congratulate you. Now embed it into the New Testament church. And and remember, the apostle, the, apostle, the evangelist, the pastor, the teachers, and all these healing ministries, they're fire starters. They're not the ones who are supposed to be doing it on the platform. They're the quippers of the of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And, and we have to get away from this parish, priest, pastor, ministry, do it all mentality to see that our primary role is to mobilize and release the whole body of Christ to do on earth what he did in his body. So all those type of things. And so for me personally and Sarah, my wife and the rest of our leadership team, that's why I go down the gym. Yes, I like to go down the gym. Well, I don't like going down the gym at all, to be honest. I hate it. But I go down the gym for two reasons. One, it's good for me and one to make friends. Most of my time as a church leader, you know, in New Wine Cymru is around Christians. I go down, I talk with non-Christian friends. They tell me about their strains, their problems, their knees, their back, their, their lumps, their bumps, their wives have got problems and I offer to pray for them. They get healed. I come back, I've got a story to share on Sunday morning. It inspires them to do the same, my church congregation. It's this and it's creating this culture and this movement through intentional living, teaching, training, modeling, and equipping. And that's what leaders do, intentionality. <laughs> I'm ranting. <laughs> I hey, thanks, thanks, Julian. That was so good. <clears throat> One last, before we ask Julian to pray, uh, there's one one other question. Julian, this has been rich, <clears throat> uh, impacting. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got up. And uh, I will <clears throat> definitely be re-listening to this. I believe you came to Minnesota. Somehow, I don't know where I was. I was probably gone, but <clears throat> Jim McCracken. Invited you to come. Yeah, yeah. It was about <clears throat> 2002, I think. Yeah. Okay. Please pray for us. All right. Well, thank you for having me and trusting me. Uh, my apologies if my uh, passion has been a bit too much. <laughs> I get a bit excited and I have to calm down a bit. You want to, you want to be my wife. Feel sorry for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, let me pray for you. Yeah. Father, I thank you for these uh, wonderful people. I thank you for these sincere men and women. And I thank you that you love them so deeply. You haven't, over you haven't overlooked them. You haven't forsaken them. You haven't neglected them. You haven't moved on to the next thing or to the next person. It's not. I just. I just want to say this prophetically. Uh, uh, you. You have not been overlooked. You have not been bypassed, and God has not moved from you to the next person. You know, like somebody picks up a friend and drops a friend and move on to the next person. Uh, you have not been overlooked, bypassed, and He hasn't moved on to the next person. The anointing is as clear and as powerful upon you as the day that you first felt his call. And obviously with the maturity of time and the passing of time, the outworking of that calling looks different with the, with the, as the seasons go by. But God is still with you and for you. And he is like moving. It's like a push from heaven, even now, a push from heaven uh, upon your back to drive you forward into his fruitful purposes. And so, Father, I pray that you'll send again the Holy Spirit upon every single person on this Zoom, every person who might listen to its recording. Father, I pray for an anointing of wisdom to come upon them. I pray for a sons of Issachar anointing to come upon them that they may know the season, but not just discern the season, to know what to do. 
and not not to know what they should do, but what the people of God should do. And all the people within their orbit of influence, they will know what they should do and what God's people should do. And I release upon them with grace and favour, ears to hear and wisdom to perceive and discern what should be done now. I pray you'll give them a grace for um, execution and release of God's people in this season. I pray you'll give them their heart's desire, and I, I, I sense there's a desire for collaboration and unity in working and probably not really knowing where to start, but I pray that an anointing, a clothing of heaven, like a Jacob's coat of many colors will come upon them and there shall be, in a, there shall be the many colors brought together in one garment with, their, with the people of influence that they know of but are not yet working together as closely as they would like. I also pray for an anointing of healing and mission. And I pray for a fresh move of evangelism and healing, but not just for them, but to equip others and that there would be a release and a mobilization of healing and evangelism in the everyday situation through the everyday people of God. And I ask, Father, your encouragement and favor would rest upon them. And I pray that they would know a deepening sense of your love and approval in this season of their life, that there would not be any doubts or shadow of a doubt of their standing before you or of the, your approval over them, or even the way that they've lived their lives or conducted their ministries, but they shall know the favor and the smile of God upon their life in this particular season of their lives. So bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will... Be in contact uh, for future meetings like this where we broaden out our regular Thursday call. Uh, if I may comment just on that prophetic word you released, brother, I received that. Yes. And there's others that need to receive that. And thank you for that. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, God bless each of you. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, may Jesus reveal himself to you like never before in the hiding place that we can be released to the public place from that hiding place. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Blessings to all. Thank you, God. Thank you all.